Hi, I'm Dr. Katherine Hayhoe, a climate scientist. The film Don't Look Up has generated a lot of conversation around climate, as has the United Nations' latest very alarming IPCC report. And we're going to discuss how we can take this concern and turn it into effective action. I'm joined by Selwyn Hart, Special Advisor to the United Nations on Climate Action, by U.S. Climate Envoy John Kerry, by activist Shia Bastide, and by Adam McKay, who's the director of Don't Look Up. Your breathing is stressing me out. This will affect the entire planet. I know, but it's like so stressful. I always joke that there's a lot of different ways that you are creatively inspired. You're inspired by emotion, of course, but it can be a laugh. It can be something beautiful you've seen. Well, in this case, it was stark terror that, <laughs> that motivated this film. So I had read the IPCC report from three, four years ago. I had spoken to a lot of scientists, including Dr. Hayos with us. And I kept asking, is this really as bad as I'm seeing? Because I had been led to believe that this was 80 years away. This was 100 years away. And what I kept hearing back is no. Yet I kept seeing a culture treating this like just a story. Even in the face of scientific certainty around what was going to happen, there was this inertia around action. And that's precisely what we're seeing with climate. To care about climate change and to understand why climate action matters, we only have to be one thing, and that one thing is quite literally a human being living on this planet. The IPCC tells us the planet is heating, the ice is melting. We're nearing a point of no return. We have to do everything that we can to keep the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement alive. We're now at 1.2 degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. And we're seeing unprecedented impacts all over the world. Fires, storms, floods. Hey, cheers everyone, huh? There's that powerful scene at the end of the movie where people are sitting around the table, you know, kind of coming together for their final moments and talking about the things that they were grateful for and made a difference in their lives. We can't wait till then. We really did have everything, didn't we? Really the whole driving force of the movie was that ending. And it was the idea that as many clicks and as many bright colors as there are and as many career goals as we have, you are missing the biggest looming threat that has ever hit mankind. And that's terrifying. It's also sort of a relief to acknowledge it. There's a little part of it that's funny. Don't look up! When we think about climate change, we often think of those very few but very loud voices who reject the science. But the good news is, is they are less than 10% of the population. 70% of us in the United States are already worried about climate change. And according to the Yale Program on Climate Communication, only 8% of us are activated. So the biggest gap we have is not between people who say yes or no whether climate is changing. It's the biggest gap between people who are very worried about it already but who are not activated. What's the first step to activation? Among people who don't know what to do, it's using our voice. It is the absolutely critical first step because you know what? Most of us aren't doing it. Across the whole country, there is a deafening climate silence. We're not having those conversations because we don't know where to start and we don't know how to end that isn't more depressed than where we began. So here's the secret. Begin with something we have in common, connect the dots to climate change. It's about meeting people where they're at and realizing that a lot of the times some people have the inclination to lead something, but most people need to be shown how dots are connected. And that is kind of what we are doing in the youth climate movement. You know, we are never going to get a change in policy, a change in the business model, a change in education model if we don't have a movement behind it. And movements cannot start without a changing narrative. And that's why movies like this are important, because what needs to change is culture. And once culture changes, everything else comes easier. So if you want to be part of the pushing, join a climate group. You don't have to do much more than use your voice, like Catherine Hayhoe said. The best thing you can do is learn so you can communicate with people who you're in contact with every day. And I think young people all around the world are 
sending an enormous message to so-called adults who are not really behaving like adults. And you have a hue and cry from every country in the world where young people are saying, what are you doing to our future? And at the local level, you have a hell of a lot more response actually to these kinds of things, the mayors and the governors. So there's a lot of activity at the grassroots level. And that is the way we're gonna hold people accountable. The excitement is that the young people have become masters at seeing through misinformation and propaganda. Most advertisement is catered to my generation. And what we really are looking for is truth. We want to be able to trust companies. We look right through greenwashing. We are looking for truth, but we're not getting it. And a lot of the times it's because that truth is not communicated properly. As youth climate activists, we are not only going to call people out for not telling us things like they are, but we're also, with that information, going to push forward action in every single sector. Call it 70% and let's just, let's move on. But it's not even close to 70%. You cannot go around saying to people that there's a 100% chance that they're going to die. You know, it's just... Nuts. The IPCC also tells us there are solutions if we act now. This is a case where we have the answer right in front of us, and it's renewables. And they're actually, for the most part, cheaper than fossil fuels. Ending coal is the single most important step that can be taken to keep this 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. The Secretary General said that fossil fuels are choking the planet and that's a correct assessment. So we must end the global addiction to fossil fuels. We must exit coal as quickly as possible. Everybody can make a difference. You can make a difference at home, in the products you decide to buy, what kind of car you drive, involving yourself in the local community. And, and you can make a difference by being one of those people who marches to Washington or marches to the state capitol. The people who don't want to change and who are in some cases, just doing the bidding of powerful interests in our country, they need to see that their ability to stay in a position of power is threatened if they're not responding to the needs of the community. And everybody can be part of that. Secretary Kerry is right. It's, it's going to require a cultural movement. Every corporation, every president, prime minister's office around the world should be bringing in climate communicators and scientists and hearing the real truth here because what's happening right now is a total abdication of responsibility as leaders, as business leaders. What's scary is a lot of these oil companies and fossil fuel companies, they really wanna keep their profits in the moment. So they'll use some of that science like carbon removal, carbon capture as kind of a, a false hope so they can just keep making profits. But the number one thing is renewables. You see that there's a lot of protests in the movie. You see that there's a lot of movement. And that's what's important. Behind any type of global change, there needs to be people behind. Because when we see each other as part of a community, that is when you don't burn out. That's when you stay nurtured. We need to increase the share of renewables in the energy mix by at least threefold. Yes, we need to reduce emissions, but we know that impacts are happening. They're accelerating in vulnerable countries. If you're living in Central America, if you're living in South America, East, Central, or West Africa, South Asia, or in a small island developing state, you are 15 times more likely to die from a climate impact. And these are countries that have contributed least to the climate problem. Climate justice does not stop at the borders of the United States. There needs to be an equal focus on supporting these countries to build resilience to climate impacts. It's a moral imperative. Every dollar of climate finance for adaptation, it saves a life in the developing world. We're trying to tell you this whole time, it's right there. It's the fundamental bottom line of that film is we are living in a brutal age of denialism. That denialism has existed about cigarette smoking, about ozone, about acid rain, but you left at the end with a very clear understanding of the dilemma we are now in. We know with scientific certainty what is going to happen if we don't act with a much greater sense 
of urgency, but yet we continue to see this inertia all over the world. And this really has to be a moment where we accelerate our effort really to solve the climate crisis. We're trying to tell you that the entire planet is about to be destroyed. I want people to feel optimistic about the possibilities because we should be. 80% of all the emissions come from 20 countries. And we're working with them very closely to help them reduce their emissions, get off coal, transition to the new technologies, the new energy future. Trillions of dollars are now beginning to move to do this, but we've got to get people to vote climate per se. What I never imagined was that the world would have the response that it's had. And it's been remarkable. There are just look up days spreading all around the world. I was very heartened to see countries like Pakistan, Nigeria, Vietnam respond to the message of this movie, which is we are living in a everything is fine economy and a la di da economy, I call it. And we're being lied to and it's not the truth. And uh, we are facing a threat that is so much bigger than we can ever imagine. You don't have to change who you are as a person to be part of the solution. And I think Adam McKay really showed us that. You have to learn about new things every day. And that in your brain makes you have so many more connections and allows you to talk to different groups of people. I can never give up hope that we will be incapable of solving a crisis that is within our capacity to solve. The UN has on its website, the Act Now campaign, which details individual actions that can be taken by individuals as consumers, as voters, as investors. In addition to all that we are doing, we can make a difference to do our part, play a small part, to address the climate crisis. Our hope is not in a single person, a single place, or a single action. Our hope is in what we can all do together. The IPCC concludes this. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters. Every choice matters and every action matters. So where do we find our hope? We find our hope in acting and knowing that we are not alone, that there are millions of hands on that giant boulder of climate action pushing it down the hill. So people often say, well, what should I do? And my answer is do something, anything, and talk about it. <laughs>